let's go ahead and talk about our subject today. So what's on tap? We are going to talk about proper glassware and pouring techniques. So this is a fun topic. There's a lot of content in this one. So uh, I've got a lot to talk about. Let's dive in, talk about glassware. Why do we even use glassware? Well, using a glass really enhances the beer drinking experience in a number of different ways. First of all, it enhances the aroma of the beer. Uh, we talked about uh, early on in, in the first session, the relationship between aroma and flavor and how much aroma really plays a role in your perception of flavor in beer. So when you're drinking out, if you have a bottle of beer, for example, or a can, and you're drinking out of that bottle or can, you don't have that ability to have those aromas be approaching your nose in the same way as when you're drinking out of a glass. So just having that wide opening really enhances the aroma. It's going to enhance your aroma perception and thus your flavor perception. Uh, additionally, it enhances the, the appearance. And this might seem like a minor uh, thing, but it really does play a big role. The appearance of the beer matters a lot. Uh, someone famously said one time that you drink with your eyes first. And that's the truth, because if a beer looks beautiful, it's more like, likely to taste beautiful. Um, and if it uh, just looks like trash, well, you know, you know what it's probably going to taste like. Um, another way that it, it enhances the beer drinking experience is that it releases carbonation. So a little bit of carbonation release uh, can, it lowers that carbonation level and that's less gas that you have in your stomach. So you get less of that kind of bloaty, uh, bloaty gassy feeling. Um, another, uh, another reason why we use glassware is that it allows you to pour the beer off of the yeast of bottle condition beers. We're gonna talk about that in a little more detail later on. Uh, and if you have big bottles, if you have, uh, you know, a champagne size bottle, 750 milliliter bottle, it allows you to share this with others. You can pour yourself a smaller serving or you can share multiple glasses with people instead of just drinking out of a giant bottle. Uh, so those are some of the reasons why we use glassware in the first place. So that said, I want to talk about uh, cleaning glassware. This is a very important aspect of beer service, is making sure that we have a beer clean glass. So what is a beer clean glass? Well, it's not necessarily a glass that has just been cleaned. Uh, you can clean a glass and have it not be beer clean. It's a, it's a certain level of cleanliness we're looking for. So a beer clean glass is both free of soil and it's free of oil. So that oil part is the one that's tricky and can be kind of elusive for people. So how do you know if your glass is beer clean? When you order a beer at a bar or restaurant, uh, like we're all wishing we could right now, <laughs> uh, when you order, uh, when you get that freshly poured beer, how do you know if your glass is clean? Well, for one, a clean glass is going to give you foam stability. So it's going to give you the ability to have a nice head formed on top and it'll be stable. Uh, whereas a dirty glass, uh, that foam will be more likely to, to collapse early or have no foam at all. Another sign of a dirty glass is bubbles stuck to the inside of the glass. So I think most of you have probably seen this before, and some of you may have seen it and not really realized what it was. When you order a beer and it has bubbles stuck to the inside of the glass on a freshly poured beer, that means that there's something on the inside of that glass that the bubbles are sticking to. Because you see, bubbles don't stick to glass. Bubbles stick to stuff on glass. So they're likely sticking to some type of oily or fatty residue on the inside of the glass, something that might not have been completely visible before that beer was poured. So uh, if you get that, that's a sign that there's something on the inside of the glass. 
So your beer clean glass is going to have foam stability, no bubbles stuck to the inside of the glass. And as you drink the beer, there's going to be lacing, something that we call lacing. And I'm going to use as an example my handy Cicerone glass here. Uh, the lacing for every drink you take, it's going to leave a line of foam residue behind for each drink that you take. So that's a sign of a really beer clean glass. So you, you don't want bubbles stuck to the inside of the glass while it's full, but as you're drinking it, the clean glass will leave a little line of foam residue behind. So you can almost count the number of drinks that you took from the glass. So that lacing is a sign of a, of a clean glass. So those are all signs of how your glass, how clean your glass is after the beer has been poured. So it's really helpful to be able to find out whether your glass is clean before you pour the beer, right? Because that's really when it makes a big difference. You don't want to find after you've poured the beer, it's a little bit too late. So how do we tell if, you're, if you have a beer clean glass before you pour the beer? So there's two good ways to be able to tell. One is called the sheeting test. So with the sheeting test, what we do is we wet the interior of the glass. So if you have a three or a four well sink uh, behind a bar, or if you just have, you know, or you could just hold it under running water, you get the glass wet inside and out, and then you dump the water out and you hold it upside down and you watch how the water sheets off the glass. So a beer, on a beer clean glass, the water will sheet evenly. Watch how that water runs off. There'll be an even sheet of water all the way throughout the glass. If it's, uh, if it's a glass that has some oily or fatty residue, what you're gonna see is spots where the water runs around an area. So if the water is beating up on an area or avoiding a spot on the glass, that's a sign that you've got some type of oily or fatty residue. So another way that we can tell if your glass is beer clean is with the salt test. So the salt test is just one step further of the sheeting test. So we get the glass wet inside and out like we do with the sheeting test. Only this time we're taking a shaker of table salt and we shake the salt and coat the inside of the glass. And you look at the pattern of the salt so if the salt covers the, the glass uniformly, then that's a sign that your glass is clean. Now, if there's a spot where the salt doesn't stick, then that's a sign you've got some oily or fatty residue there. So uh, this is a great way to demonstrate how clean your glassware is to uh, maybe a group of people in a bar or restaurant setting. Uh, it's not always the most practical because now you've dumped salt all over your glass and it's not clean anymore, right? Uh, but that's a great way to be able to tell, again, how clean your glassware is. So now that we know the signs of the beer clean glass, how do we get that beer clean glass? So uh, we could talk about this for a long time. There are some details that we have... Uh, included in the draft beer quality manual uh, that I talked about uh, last time. The draft beer quality manual contains detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to clean glassware. But the long and short of it is that we want to wash by hand. It's always the best way. You can get a beer clean glass from a dish machine uh, for sure. But uh, to be most certain to have the most control, hand washing is great. Uh, you want to use oil-free soap. So a lot of the hand soap, a lot of the soap you have uh, that you use to clean your dishes at home, uh, that dish detergent that you use at home is oil-based. It has lanolin in it. So that those oils and that soap can deposit on your glassware and prevent it from being completely clean. So you want to use an oil-free soap in hot water with brushes in uh, in a sink. Wash your glass in the hot water and the brushes and the oil-free soap. Cold water rinse, cold fresh water rinse, and then uh, sanitize in hot water with properly measured sanitizer with a sanitizer that's designed for use with beer glassware. Uh, you want to allow that glass to 
drip dry, inverted on a rack or some type of drying mat uh, that allows air to circulate underneath. Don't towel dry your glasses. And then right before pouring, you give it a fresh water rinse, either in a sink or on a rinse or at a draft system. So that's the nutshell version of how to get a beer clean glass. So now we've got a beer clean glass and we want to pour the beer. So how do we pour the beer? What are some good methods of pouring the beer? So uh, the way we pour the beer is going to depend on where it's coming from. Let's start with draft beer. So one of the big obstacles that you see at some bars and restaurants to pouring a good glass of draft beer is frosted glassware. So we've all seen the frosted mugs being pulled out of, out of the freezer uh, at the bar. Uh, these are still fairly common and some people still enjoy those, uh, but they can be really problematic for pouring beer. So when you're pouring into a frosted mug, one of the things that you're almost definitely gonna get is lots of foam. Uh, because the ice crystals that are in the glass are going to cause gas breakout and this chain reaction of foam, and you'll end up with a big glass full of foam. And then oftentimes you see uh, that glass full of foam, the bartender working that foam and tipping the foam off and trying to get that glass full of actual beer. And then by the time they get it full of beer, well, all the gas has been knocked out and the beer is probably flat. So not very good. Um, that's one big problem. Another problem is that frosted mugs make your beer so cold that you're going to have a really hard time enjoying its full aroma and flavor. The full aromas don't fully release until a beer has a chance to warm up a little bit. We serve beer typically on the average draft system at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. I mentioned that uh, in the last class. Um, that gives your chance, that gives your beer a chance to warm up a little bit and release its aromas as you're consuming it. In a frosted mug, it's going to be so cold that it won't really have a chance uh, for that to happen. Um, and then another problem that can come up with frosted mugs is if a glass is pulled right out of sanitizer solution and then placed right into the freezer, and then that sanitizer is frozen on the glass. And then what you end up with when you get the full glass of beer is you get an iceberg floating in the middle of your glass. That iceberg is basically a sanitizer iceberg floating in your beer. So uh, now you have kind of sanitizer flavored beer. Not very good. Um, so frosted glassware is generally problematic. Uh, personally, when I see a bartender pulling a frosted mug out of a, out of a cooler after I've ordered a beer, I try to stop them and ask for a room temperature glass. Um, so knowing that, let's assume that we have a beer clean glass. That's not a frosted glass. We take our beer clean glass, and like I said before, we're going to give this a quick water rinse right before we pour uh, our draft beer. And then what we're going to do, and I'm going to use another prop here. I've got my faucet. Uh, we're going to take our glass and we're going to hold the glass at 45 degree angle under the faucet. We're not going to touch the faucet to the glass. If you touch the faucet to the glass, you could chip the glass and any anything that might be on that faucet on the outside of that faucet is now going to transfer into that beer. So hopefully our faucets are clean. But if by some chance you do have some type of dried beer residue or you have any type of microbial growth on there, that's going to transfer to your beer glass. So you want to avoid that. So don't touch the faucet to the glass. So you want to hold it about an inch away, hold it fairly close, and then you want to open the faucet quickly. So the way these faucets work is you open it all the way fairly quickly. If you open it just part of the way, if you just crack it open, it's going to give you nothing but foam. The faucet only operates correctly, and it only delivers clear beer if it's completely open all the way. So you open that all the way with your glass 45 degrees, uh, about an inch underneath, 
And then as it gets to about a half to two thirds full, you'll stand the glass up and then you'll lower the glass down, lower it down a little bit. And that's when you control the foam that's being formed. So the amount you hold, the amount you pull that glass down is going to, uh, you, if you pull it down more, it's going to give you more foam. If it's, if you keep it close, it's going to give you less foam. And that's when you're kind of, uh, judging how much foam is being formed naturally and whether you need to manage more foam or not. Um, and so what you want to end up with is about a one inch collar of foam on top of your beer. So that's going to cover most styles of beer. Now, there are some styles of beer that are very effervescent and are traditionally served with a larger collar of foam, sometimes as much as two inches or more. Uh, beers, this would be beers like uh, a German Weiss beer, for example, or some Belgian styles. Um, and so one last important note is that as you're pouring, even if you're keeping it close, even if there's a lot of natural head formation and you want to keep it close to keep from uh, forming too much, you don't ever want to dunk the faucet into the beer. Because if you're dunking the faucet into the beer itself, now you're getting beer residue on the outside of the faucet. You're transferring whatever might be on the faucet into the beer. And that beer residue on the outside is going to dry it's going to attract fruit flies potentially. It's going to be a source of microbial growth. And it's just simply not sanitary. So no matter what we're doing here, we want to keep the faucet away from the glass. Don't touch the faucet to the glass. Don't dunk the faucet into the beer. So that's a little bit about pouring draft beer. Let's talk now about pouring bottled beer. So when we're pouring bottled beer, we want to first determine whether the beer that we're pouring out of the bottle has been bottle conditioned or not. So some bottle beers are fully filtered. That means there's no, no secondary fermentation has taken place in the bottle. Uh, so fully filtered beer would be poured pretty much the same way. So you would, uh, you would hold the glass at a 45 degree angle, you'd pour you keep the bottle close, pour it down the side to start, stand it up after about half to two thirds full, and then lower it down a little bit more if you need to form a little more head or keep it close if you don't and pour the whole bottle into the glass. Pretty simple stuff. So there's a little bit more that we have to consider if it's a bottle conditioned beer. So we talked about bottle conditioning in a previous session. Bottle conditioning, if you didn't catch that session, is where we have a secondary fermentation in the bottle. This reduces oxygen levels in the bottle and gives us a longer shelf life. This is why most breweries bottle condition their beer. So this bottle conditioning, this second fermentation in the bottle, produces a yeast sediment in the bottom of the bottle. So I've got a bottle here that I pulled out of my fridge. This is a, a bottle of... Uh, Jolly Pumpkin Bam Beer, and this is a bottle conditioned beer. I don't know if you can really see this here, but there's a, a little bit of bottle conditioning yeast at the bottom of this here. Not really super visible on here, but I can see here, there's some definite sediment in the bottom of this beer here. And so uh, that, uh, that bottle conditioning yeast, uh, needs to be managed. Um, we typically are not going to be serving that yeast. Uh, so the yeast is often going to be decanted. So this isn't always the case. This is a customer preference. Some customers may prefer uh, the yeast to be served on the beer. And we'll talk about how to do that. Uh, and in some cases, it's actually, uh, in some styles, it's traditional to serve the yeast on the beer, like with a German Weiss beer, for example. But if we're going to decant the beer, we want to, first of all, make sure that the bottle has been uh, allowed to stand upright for a while. We want that yeast to be stable at the bottom of the bottle. Um, so... We don't want that to be disturbed. You don't want to be swirling the bottle around because that gets the yeast all up in suspension and now it's hard to separate the beer from the yeast. 
So uh, what we're going to do to start is we're going to pop the bottle open. We're going to, uh, and I've got my, I'm going to go ahead and pour this beer just as a demonstration. I'm going to use my handy dandy Cicerone bottle opener. You can find these on our website. Uh, we're going to pop this bottle open. Take our beer clean glass. We're going to start. So I'm going to explain what I'm going to do first, and then I'm going to do it. Uh, so we're going to start down the down the side, 45 degree angle, like we talked about, and then stand it up. But what I'm going to do is as I'm pouring, I'm not going to be looking at the beer going into the glass. I'm going to be looking right here. I'm going to be looking right at the neck of the bottle. And in the right light, what I'm going to be looking for is I'm going to be watching that beer going up the neck of the bottle, but then I'm going to be looking for the yeast that will be sneaking up the neck of the bottle. So as I get close to finishing the pour, I'm going to see that yeast start to creep up. And as soon as that yeast gets up to the neck of the bottle, I'm going to stop pouring. And if you've not disturbed the yeast and you stop pouring at the right time, we're going to end up with just a little bit of uh, maybe a centimeter of beer with the yeast at the bottom and a clear beer in the glass. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm holding this up a little bit higher than I normally would. 45 degree angle. And woo, got a nice color of foam on there. And I got a nice full glass. This is a very effervescent beer. I got to the end, uh, or I got a full glass before I ever really finished pouring my full bottle uh, because this is very effervescent and poured a nice collar of foam. This is American wild ale that, uh, that really probably deserves a larger collar of foam on top. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a nice clear pour right there. <sighs> All right. Very nice. Um, so one other note about pouring that bottle conditioned beer. Um, let's say that instead of a single serving bottle, we've got a 750, which is going to have multiple servings. And let's say you want to pour it for four people. What we don't want to do, we don't want to pour the first glass and then stand it back up and then grab the second glass and then pour and stand it back up and continue that way. If that's what we do, by the time we've poured two glasses, we've already done this two times with our bottle. Well, now we've got that yeast all roused up. So that third glass is going to be pretty cloudy. And so is the fourth glass. In fact, you might, if you're pouring four glasses that way, you might have four different beers. You might have a clear one, slightly cloudy, very cloudy, and then one that's got yeast chunks on it. You don't want that. You want to pour four glasses that look the same, four clear glasses. So what we'll do in that instance is we'll pour the first beer. And then as we pour, we, when we get finished with that pour, we'll just tilt the bottle back far enough to stop the pour, but we won't stand it upright. And then we pick up our second glass, we'll pour into that one, and then just tilt it slightly back. So we'll just tilt it as much as we need to without going back and forth. Uh, and what that will allow us to do is pour four or however many glasses that are all the same and all clear with no yeast. So then if we are serving the yeast, what you're going to want to do is you would take the bottle, swirl it around a little bit. And if somebody decided they wanted that in this beer here, you'd pour it right on top. And you can see what it did to that beer. Hopefully you can see that out in YouTube land. No turn that to show you my cool Cicerone glass, but it's very cloudy now with lots of yeast. And the flavor profile is quite different. Um, it's the same beer, but yeast is going to add a little bit of different character to it. Be careful if that is an older bottle, if it's been aged for any period of time or for an extended period of time, the yeast may have 
uh, died in the bottom of the bottle and it, those yeast cells can rupture and release some very unpleasant aromas in the beer. So this, if it's an old bottle, you probably want to decant the beer and you don't want to serve that yeast. Okay, so that gets us to the end of the session. Um, we're going to start q and I've got uh, several questions here that have been rolling in and I'm going to try and answer all of them. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to remind you about the survey. Uh, there is a survey that is posted uh, that if you want, if you want to sign up for a chance to win a free certified beer server exam, click a link on the survey. There it went right there. Uh, just got posted on the side. Uh, click that survey fill it out for a chance to win a free certified beer server exam. We're giving away 10 of them. Um, this link closes at 3 p.m. Central. So you've got an hour and a half to fill that out. When I'm done here and we close this all down this session, this video will post on our YouTube channel and that link will be in the description there. So you'll still be able to click that link until 3 p.m. So go ahead and fill that out. Um, I am going to start on some questions. Let me scroll back up. Man, we've had a lot come in. Um, let's see. Uh, what's your opinion on the Teku glass? Should we buy it or practice with this? Uh, well, the Teku glass is, is just one of many different types of glassware uh, that are out there. We've got uh, so many different types of glassware to choose from. And some of them uh, do a very good job of enhancing the aromas and flavors of the beer. The Teku glass uh, can do that for sure. Um, I have a couple Teku glasses and sometimes I, I drink out of them. Uh, it's not my favorite, personal favorite, but I do enjoy uh, using it now and again. Um, so we have a uh, blog post, uh, this is related to this, we have a blog post called Drinking Beer at Home. Um, there's a link in, uh, in the chat, or we will put a link in the chat here uh, to, to that. Uh, and uh, in that blog post, you'll find a discussion of different types of glassware. Um, are drinking vessels like snifters and goblets designed to exchange heat with your hands or should you hold them by the stem? Well, uh, so any stemmed glassware is designed with a stem for you to be able to hold it with the, by the stem if you want and not heat up the beverage that you're drinking. Uh, so this can be very handy with beer and trying to maintain the current temperature. Now, if you are using a snifter or a goblet and it has the beer in, and the beer in there is maybe a little bit too cold for your preference, that does give you the option of holding it, you know, holding it by the, by the goblet or holding it by, you know, by the bottom and warming it up a little bit, as opposed to holding it by the stem and, you know, and allowing it to maintain temperature. So, uh, so it's kind of, it allows you that, you know, to do either way, but the, just by the nature of the stem being there, it's kind of designed for you to hold it by that stem. Next question. Is it okay if we pour beer into a glass with a little water in it? Well, yeah. So you're giving a fresh water rinse right before pouring and that conditions the glass and kind of prepares it for pouring. So just by the nature of doing that, there's going to be a little bit of water in there. And, and it's, it's so negligible that it's not going to affect anything. It's going to give you a better pour. Um, that said, we, you don't want like actual, like, you know, several ounces of water in there. That's a little bit different, but just having a wet glass shouldn't be a problem. Uh, next question. How frequently or under what circumstances are you sending dirty beer glasses back when encountered? Uh, so how you deal with uh, any type of service issue at a bar or restaurant, this includes dirty glassware or other things. Uh, how I deal with it is a function of many things. How bad is the problem? Is it gonna prevent me from enjoying my beer? Um, and how likely is it that 
the the bartender or the server or the manager uh, that they will be receptive to that. Um, so it can be it can be a tricky situation. There's a little bit of diplomacy you have to take in mind, keep in mind, and just how bad is it? Uh, if the glass is just filthy and covered in bubbles, top to bottom, and there's no head at all, and it and and it's really bad, I'm probably going to send it back. If there's a little patch on the glass that's got some bubbles stuck to it, I'm probably going to put up with it. Um, I might say something if they're people, you know, depending on who it is. So you kind of have to have to judge that on your own. Um, what detergent do you recommend to wash beer glasses at home? So we do have, uh, again, I'm going to mention that drinking beer at home, uh, post that we have on our, uh, on our blog, that drinking beer at home page, uh, references, uh, uh, detergent for washing glasses at home. Uh, so you can find, uh, certain types of, uh, glassware soap. Uh, online. I use something called uh, TDC from National Chemical. Uh, I think that's a very fine soap. That's not the only one available, uh, but it's lanolin free and I use it to wash my glassware. I used it to wash this glass here. So it came out, uh, came out very nice. Um, so uh, yeah, check out that blog post. Next question, is racking on a surface to dry glass better than hanging glasses to dry? Seems airflow would be equal. I've heard hanging contributes to more airborne contamination. Uh, I would say that if, if you're only, uh, if you're just drying the glass, as long as there's airflow underneath, I don't know if one particular environment is better than the other. Uh, whether it's hanging or it's on a mat, as long as air can get underneath. What you don't want to do is you don't want to put it upside down on a flat surface that keeps air from circulating. Otherwise, I would say it's all pretty much the same. Uh, next question. I understand we should not towel dry glassware, but how should we go about polishing? Well, so polishing should really be uh, much of a concern. You can towel dry the outside if you're concerned about it. Uh, but if you're, if you're cleaning glassware properly and drying it the right way, uh, you probably are not going to be getting any spotting on the glassware and it shouldn't affect the appearance, uh, of the beer at all. Next question. What's the best way to avoid those watermarks that get left on beer glasses while it's drying? So again, this is kind of a related thing. Uh, I think on the outside, you can, uh, you can polish those off, uh, but on the inside, uh, it's not really going to be much of a concern once you pour the beer in there. Um, and if you're cleaning the glassware the right way, uh, it's probably, you're probably not going to be having that much of an issue. We have very hard water here in Kansas City where I live, and when I'm washing my glassware by hand and I allow them to drip dry upside down, I don't have any issue with spotting and spotting is usually an issue when you have, uh, um, very hard water. Uh, but you know, uh, it's, uh, it's not much of an issue for me, but if it is an issue for you, you could polish the outside again. And on the inside, it really shouldn't make that much of a difference. It's, uh, once you pour the beer in, you're not even going to notice. Um, what about pouring stouts? I've seen high volume bars. Just let it pour freely until the bartender is ready. Uh, I figured the same pour instructions are recommended. So uh, I, I believe this is a question about uh, a, a multi-stage pour of a stout of a nitro stout like Guinness. So that's a whole other, uh, whole other thing. A, a, a two part pour of the beer with a nitro beer allows the, a certain, allows the head to form on top. So with, uh, you know, if you're pouring into, uh, you're pouring a stout into like a pint glass, I mean, this isn't a pint glass, but you pour it half to two thirds full, and then you let that cascade settle out 
into uh, into a nice thick creamy head and then finish the pour that it allows that head to remain more firm and build up a little bit more and be a little bit more prominent and you can get that nice set head on top and that active cascade in the beer as the customer gets it. So that two-part pour can really give you uh, a better presentation and a nice, thicker, creamier head on top. Um, can you talk about English cask ale pouring using the pump? Uh, so this is a whole different method of service. Uh, we could do a whole other... Uh, CBS prep talk on Cascale if we wanted to. Uh, Cascale is beer that has uh, on, undergone secondary fermentation in the cask that it is uh, served from and not served with any extraneous CO2 pressure. So it's pumped out with a hand pump and it goes through a, a, an ex, it goes through a faucet head that they call a swan neck. It's this long extended piece where they actually, this is the one method of service where it's acceptable to dunk the faucet into the glass. So they put it all the way to the bottom of the glass and then you typically two or three pumps will fill your pint up uh, from the bottom. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the one method of service where dunking the faucet in the beer is acceptable. Of course, then wiping it clean uh, with uh, some type of, uh, you know, some type of sanitizer or of some sort or, you know, making sure that it's clean in between pouring. Um, next question. Why do some bars rinse the glass with water before pouring the beer? So I, I mentioned this before. I think this is a great thing to do. Uh, when you're pouring into a dry glass, uh, the friction of the liquid hitting that surface of the glass is going to cause more carbonation breakout. And that carbonation breakout can, in some instances, lead to a chain reaction of foaming. So you end up with a little bit more uncontrolled foam than you might want. Whereas a wetted surface is going to make a smoother transition when the beer first hits it. And then you have control over how much foam is created on the beer as opposed to it maybe getting out of control. So that's one reason. Another is that it rinses out any, uh, if there's potentially any sanitizer residue in there, it rinses that out. Uh, if there's any lint or debris from storage that might be in there. So it's just ensuring that's that one last step, you're rinsing anything out and preparing the surface for pouring. It also chills the glass just slightly too. Next question. Are there different pouring rates or glass angles for different style beers? Uh, well, so most draft systems are designed to pour at one gallon per minute or roughly two ounces uh, per second. Um, and we use that for pretty much every style of beer. So there's not really a pouring rate for a particular style of beer. Um, there might be a differences in desired end result. Uh, like I talked about different uh, amount of head for uh, German Weiss beer, for example, or certain Belgian styles. Uh, you know, I felt like the beer I poured here was appropriate with a good couple inches head of head. The American Wild Ale, it's, it's a very effervescent beer. Um, so uh, that would be more of the difference than actual pouring rate, I think. Um, next question. Anything wrong if I personally like to have most of the yeast in my glass? No, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, pouring yeast into the beer is a personal preference. Uh, if you enjoy the beer more that way, then by all means do it. Um, but in a service situation where you're dealing with customers, don't assume that a customer wants that. So if you're serving customers and you're serving a bottle conditioned beer, always ask them their preference. Um, and if and by default, you should be decanting the beer. Um, next question What does the yeast in beer taste like if it's not too old to serve? Well, so in general, you know, some people describe it as yeasty, which is uh, kind of a funny way to describe yeast. Duh, it's yeasty. Um, you know, some people, uh, it does have a little bit of a of a bitterness to it. Um, 
and uh and it does it it's uh it's difficult to say and it sometimes it depends on the beer right uh so with hoppy beers it could potentially have uh more hop compounds in that yeast uh but uh i think in general there's going to be a slight bitterness it could potentially have a little bit of astringency in there as well um next question there are times when a bottle with yeast settled at the bottom rouses all the yeast merely by opening the bottle. What do you do in that instance? Well, uh, if you sometimes if you open a very effervescent bottle or uh, certain high carbonated beers uh, will uh, sometimes agitate quite a bit uh, or it might have oxalate crystals in there that cause it to gush slightly. Um, if that happens and it rouses the yeast, well, you know, there's probably not a whole lot you can do about it. Uh, you could let it sit for a little bit and try and get some of that yeast to settle out. But at the same time, uh, you know, the longer you let it sit, uh, you know, you're going to be losing some carbonation over an extended period. So, uh, you might just kind of, uh, have to play the hand that you're dealt, so to speak. Um, so, you know. Sometimes that's, uh, that's just the breaks. Um, can you use a 38 degree glass to keep glass from warming your beer too quickly? Sure. Yeah. You can use, you can pour into a chilled glass to keep your beer from warming up too fast. There's nothing wrong with using a chilled glass. Um, frosted glassware on the other hand, uh, can be very problematic for all the reasons I stated earlier. How does one decant beer? So uh, decanting beer is just simply pouring the beer off of the yeast. That's exactly the method I showed you when I poured uh, the beer I had, where you don't rouse the bottle uh, before serving, make sure the yeast is at the bottom, and then pour it until, uh, until you see that yeast coming up to the neck of the bottle, and then you stop pouring. And, that, and now you've decanted the beer. Um, what's the difference between a thin and a thick glass? Well, uh, some of it is just, you know, obviously it's, uh, just different manufacturers have different, uh, thickness of glass. Um, the, uh, the thick glass, um, can have a tendency to actually, in some instances, uh, warm your beer up a little bit. Because there's going to be, if it's a room temperature glass and you have a thick glass, that glass could potentially uh, be storing some heat in that glass that could transfer into the beer, potentially. Um, or if it's cold, it could transfer that, uh, that cold to the, to the beer. Uh, but that would be the main difference between a, a thick and thin glass. What's your opinion on creamer faucets? Uh, so creamer faucets are basically designed to uh, break nitrogen gas out of a nitro beer. Uh, so for pouring uh, beers that are saturated with nitrogen, beers like Guinness, for example, um, a creamer faucet is necessary. If you don't have a nitro beer, don't use a creamer faucet. Um, so that's it's as simple as that. Uh, what about different glasses for different beer styles? Uh, yeah, so there are some styles of glassware that are uh, traditionally used with uh, certain styles of beer. German Weiss beer, for example, has a specific glass uh, that's used with uh, if you've uh, if you sat in uh, Pat Fahey's uh, tasting together session on Kolsch beer. Uh, he talked about the Stanga glass that's used in service of Kolsch beer. Um, so there, there is a uh, tradition with certain styles uh, that associates them with certain types of glass, certain shapes of glassware. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, when I am drinking a certain style of beer, I try and put it into, if I have that particular glass that goes with that style, I'll, I'll use that. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes that glass is used because it can enhance certain characteristics of the beer. Um, 
let's see. Uh, what about pouring nitro beer or cask ale regarding 45 degree angle? So yeah, the nitro beer, when pouring a nitro beer, like we talked about that kind of two stage pour, that's typically not done at an angle. You typically would hold that straight up. Uh, nitro beers, you don't have to worry so much about controlling foam. Uh, with nitro beers, we actually want it to foam that we want that nitrogen to break out. So, uh, and then with Cascale, of course, we're pouring that from the bottom, like I talked about. Um, what about pouring CO2 versus on nitro? So again, uh, this is kind of uh, more of a dispense gas question. So, uh, you know, uh, CO2 is, is straight CO2 is used for regularly carbonated beers. There are certain blends that have CO2 and nitrogen uh, that have a whole lot of nitrogen in them, like 75% nitrogen. Those are used for nitro beers. This is a little off topic, so I'm going to kind of shelve that, but there's a lot of information um, uh, regarding that question in the draft beer quality manual. Um, with some kegs, once you come close to the end of the barrel, the color of the last few pints all differ from the original color of the beer. Uh, is this also due to proteins settling in the keg? Uh, yes, more than likely. Um, there are a lot of beers that have a natural protein haze. That haze can have a tendency to settle to the bottom of the keg. And then as that keg empties, you start to get that more concentrated protein haze in the beer. So that's, uh, that's not an uncommon phenomenon. Um, where can we find a reliable glassware guide for each beer style? Um, so uh, we have a set of course books that are called uh, the Road to Cicerone course books uh, that focus on different topics uh, that, uh, that you would study in preparing for the certified Cicerone exam. And we have one on keeping and serving, which, and it's got a great guide in there uh, that connects the different glassware uh, for each uh, style that it would be associated with. So I would refer you to that book. You can find that on our website. That's the Road to Cicerone Keeping and Serving course book. Um, why do some pint glasses have a wider rib three quarter up the glass? And what is that for? Uh, I think you're referring to what's called a nonic pint. Uh, the nonic pint looks like a traditional pint glass. And then about three quarter up, it has a little bubble a little bump out. So that eases, that helps uh, a, a few different things. So it allows you to stack them a little more easily uh, without damaging the glass. Uh, it also, if it gets knocked over, it hits that, that, uh, that raised portion uh, and then the glass is less likely to break. And if the glass is wet, uh, it gives you a little bit of something to grip onto. So some little advantages of that. Um, if we take a beer in a glass and want another glass of beer, would the glass potentially have lasting or bubbles stuck on the glass? Um, so I think you're referring to what's the condition of the glass going to be like if we reuse it? Um, so in general, in any type of service situation, we are not going to be reusing glassware. Uh, in any type of bar or restaurant or any service situation, the customer always gets a clean glass for every beer they order. Um, at home, uh, you may, you know, depending on how long it's sat in between, if you really want to use the same glass, uh, you may notice uh, that dried foam residue may uh, prevent uh, you from getting the right appearance. It may uh, cause your beer to, it might cause your glass to not be as clean because that, I mean, think about what a dirty beer glass really is and what's in there. It's dried beer. So if you let your glass sit long enough, it's got dried beer in it. It's not clean. Um, what is that smell that happens in some glassware that smells like a wet dog? Uh, so that's kind of hard to say. Uh, glassware that may have not been allowed to 
dry properly and had water trapped on the inside for too long could have microbial growth. Um, it could be if it's a bar or restaurant, you, there may be some type of sanitizer aroma. Uh, there may be something that has to do with the, the wash water in a dish machine that may have been cleaned in. Hard to say exactly. Next question. I've seen that sometimes bartenders open the faucet one second before they start pouring into the glass like they're avoiding the first part of the beer in the lines. Is this a real thing? Uh, so the reason why bartender, why you've probably seen bartenders doing that is because when you open a faucet uh, and the traditional faucet, you've got right, right back behind the plunger of the faucet is a little bit of beer that's uh, not chilled as much as the rest of the beer in the draft line. And that's going to give you a little shot of foam. Uh, and so a, a bartender uh, when they're pouring and one needs to control the amount of foam that's being formed in the glass. And that little shot of foam can sometimes be difficult to manage. Some bartenders kind of cheat by opening it, letting that shot of foam go down the drain and then getting the glass underneath. Um, so that's why they're doing that. Um, a good bartender with a well-designed system will know how to manage that the right way without having that beer go down the drain. Um, do certain types of glassware hold the head of the beer more than others? Uh, yeah. So certain types of glassware have a narrower, uh, uh, a narrower upper portion that can prop the head up a little bit more. Uh, Pilsner glassware, uh, traditional Pilsner glassware that's tall and thin can prop up the head a little bit more as well. Um, how is pouring a, from a can different from pouring from a bottle? You use the same principles. Pour down the side, 45 degree angle, stand it up as you finish, uh, you know, lower it down if you need to form a little more head. So really no, no difference there. Um, all right. So that gets me to the end of the question and answer session. Again, if you haven't subscribed to the Cicerone YouTube channel yet, you are on the YouTube channel. Just click subscribe below. It is that easy. Um, uh, I want to remind you that tomorrow, May 13th at 4 p.m. Central, Pat Fahey, Master Cicerone Pat Fahey is doing his Tasting Together series again. And tomorrow the beer is Flanders Red. So go out and get yourself Flanders Red. Sit in with Pat tomorrow at 4 p.m. Central. And he's going to talk about it for a while. Uh, it should be a very informative session. Uh, and then Thursday of this week, this Thursday, May 14th at 1 p.m. Central, uh, is CBS Prep Talk number eight. That is on beer style parameters, ABV, IBU, and SRM. So that's what we'll be talking about Thursday. So we will see you back here at that point. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day. See you later.